Susan, I, and I, I want to add, but if, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. I have to I'm speaking. In. She shut down Pence because she wasn't done speaking, and she said, I'm speaking, and then there were t-shirts. <laughs> I'm Nicole Holliday. I'm acting associate professor of linguistics at the University of California, Berkeley, and I study political linguistics, in particular, one politician of note, Kamala Harris. This is Academic Review, Kamala Harris Linguistics. Linguistics is the scientific study of language. So we study language like geologists study rocks. Um, and that can be anything from in the mind to in society to the structure of languages themselves. One thing that sociolinguists like me are interested in is identity. And everybody has multiple identities, right? We have a race and a class and a gender and where we're from. Kamala Harris has a lot of identities that we've never seen before in a modern politician. First of all, she's a woman, right? The previous presidents were not. Uh, she's also from California. We haven't seen a mainstream California politician since Ronald Reagan. But she's also black and South Asian, and we don't have a lot of templates for that either. All of these identities come out in the way that she talks. But us as listeners might not be really familiar with hearing a person in power that sounds like her. We have to adjust our expectations for what power sounds like, but also she has to do all of these aspects of her identity and do them authentically at all times. So if you've been online lately, you might've seen a lot of people with coconut and palm trees in their bio. Uh, they call this being coconut pilled on the internet. So people that are big fans of Kamala Harris. And that came from a speech that she gave in particular, where she she talks about the fact that we all live in the context and exist in the context of everything that came before us. You can hear aspects of her identity in the way that she pronounces things, but also in what she's talking about here. Everything is in context. My mother used to, she would give us a hard time sometimes and she would say to us, I don't know what's wrong with you young people. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> you exist in the context of all in which you live and what came before you. So I think that really resonated with people because everybody has this sense that we are existing in the context of what came before us. This is part of why it's one of her trademarks. What I hear in that clip that's interesting is every time she says you, she sounds Californian. You, th you, th you think you just fell out of a coconut tree? Beginning around her generation, young people in California started to pronounce their sounds ooh, so like in the word boot, kind of far forward in the mouth. So every time she says you in that clip, for you, she's doing it with her tongue far forward in her mouth and her lips rounded. This is a typical California feature. You metal, dude! It has since spread throughout the United States, so if you're, you know, under 40 years old, from anywhere, you might have a fronted ooh. But if she were a New Yorker, we definitely wouldn't hear that. You won't have to vote anymore, my beautiful Christians. I love you, Christians. We do have a precedent for a black president, and especially one with an immigrant parent and what that's supposed to sound like. My father was a foreign student, born and raised in a small village in Kenya. But Kamala Harris doesn't sound like Barack Obama, and in fact, she can't. In the paper I wrote about her, though, I noticed a few spots in her debate speech where she uses some grammatical or what we would call morphosyntactic features of African-American English, usually to make a rhetorical point. It is on a long list of crises of Donald Trump's making, and that's why dude gotta go, and when I am commander in chief. So she says dude gotta go. First of all, dude, pretty casual, pretty Gen X, pretty California. These are all things that she can do. Do, 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 do gotta go. In a debate, it might be a little confusing, but the fact that she says dude gotta go with no S as opposed to dudes gotta go makes it more likely that she is channeling the part of her that speaks African-American English. Do gotta go. So in the United States, African-American English is the variety spoken in mostly black communities. Kamala Harris grew up in a super multiracial uh, community that had a lot of black people, and she grew up also speaking African-American English, even before she went to Howard University, which is a place, because it's an HBCU, where people speak African-American English. So this is definitely part of her repertoire. Here, when she said, dude, gotta go, with no S, she is telling us that she is using this rhetorical style to make the point that Donald Trump should be removed from office. Do gotta, 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 gotta go. The gotta in this is also pretty interesting because it is, again, less formal than you would expect in this style. And in casual style, all Americans use gotta and gonna and things like that. But the fact that she chose to use it here, combined with the dude and go, so dude, gotta go, tells us that she's really making a sharp point 
about how self-evident it should be that Donald Trump can no longer be in office. And this works for her as a use of African-American English as well because ideologically, people imagine African-American English as having more rhetorical force. So like every human who's ever spoken a language, Kamala Harris commands multiple styles, some more formal, some less formal, and she uses them appropriately. So. So far, you know, we've been talking about her in a debate context, perhaps, but when she talks to friendly groups, like the group of Asian American activists um, that she was talking to in DC that we're about to see, she can use a style that's a little more laid back. That sometimes people will open the door for you and leave it open, sometimes they won't. And then you need to kick that door down. <laughs> You can see that this resonated with the crowd that she was talking to. There's laughter, there's applause. In the context of everything that she was saying before, it makes a lot of sense for her to say, they're not gonna leave the door open for you, you have to fight. Other people might not understand what you're capable of because you don't fit their mold of power, right? And it's interesting that it's her that's saying this to these folks because that's an experience that she's obviously had herself that she's written about and talked about. But why is she swearing here? And I can imagine my grandmother clutching her pearls at this. It's another effective rhetorical style, right? It means something more to say, kick that fucking door that down than to say, kick that door down. And it shows that with this group of young activists, she can relate with them, not only in her experiences, but also a little bit more linguistically. There's also something about the time that we're in, right? So it is more acceptable for people to use profanity um, and Donald Trump does it all the time. The Democrats have to now decide whether they will continue defrauding the public with ridiculous bullshit. He's put it on the table for the campaign. In general, women are judged more harshly for using four-letter words or, or expletives, but she really meant something there, right? It's not cursing for the sake of cursing. It became a slogan. And then you need to kick that door down. And with respect to slogans, politicians are very lucky to stumble across them once in a while. So we don't know which ones are premeditated and which ones aren't. But when she was debating Mike Pence in 2020, when they were both uh, vying for the vice presidency, she had a great slogan that we went to put on t-shirts immediately after. Well, let's get so I, but No, but Susan, I, this is important. Susan, I, and I, I, I want to add, but if, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. I have to I'm speaking. In. She shut down Pence because she wasn't done speaking. And she said, I'm speaking. And then there were t-shirts, right? It became a campaign slogan that she was able to use after that. And part of the reason that it was effective is that she seemed really calm in the delivery, right? But she also said, you're not going to talk over me. Well, the Trump tax cuts. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. Well, <laughs> I'm speaking. This is a really difficult challenge for female politicians in particular. You can think about when Hillary Clinton was running for president in 2016, how often she was called shrill. And Hillary, who's become very shrill, you know the word shrill? And combative. There is something unrelaxed about the way she is communicating. And like a school marm, like she was policing people and all of this. And when you shriek that way, it is such an unpleasant. What Kamala Harris does there is very calmly take the floor back and say, you're not gonna interrupt me because I have just as much right to be here as you do. The important is you said the truth. If you don't mind letting me finish, we can Please. then have a conversation, okay? The other reason that this resonates with people, especially women, is that it's such a common experience for women in a patriarchal society to be mansplained, to be talked over, right? To be told that they don't know or that they should shut up and, you know, go back to the kitchen or whatever that is. She took the floor back because she did have a right to be there. And so for any woman that's had to say that in their own workplace or even in their own home, this is a message that resonates. So the I'm speaking clip also kind of went viral. Maya Rudolph has parodied Kamala Harris on Saturday Night Live for several years now. And she brought up the same phrasing when she was doing the sort of fake parody of the debate with Mike Pence. Senator Harris. You see, this is what they do. Susan, they avoid taking any responsibility. We for do not. Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. <laughs> I'm speaking. Well. 
Well, I'm just but trying. I'm speaking. Oh. But yes, but yeah, I... but I'm speaking. Mm. See, I'm speaking right now. Estoya Blondo, Nevada, Arizona, some parts of Texas. I'm speaking. I understand that. I understand. I yeah, I don't think you do I because do. you're talking and I'm speaking. So she says I'm speaking so many times to sort of up the ante of the parody, right? And that's how parody works. A lot of times we see people exaggerate whatever the most sort of salient characteristic of the speaker is. I wrote a paper where I compared Maya Rudolph's performance as Kamala Harris in this setting, as well as a few other settings, to what Kamala Harris actually sounded like. And it turns out that she uses exactly the same pitch contours. So like where Kamala Harris's voice goes up, that's where Maya Rudolph's voice goes up. And when it goes down, that's where Maya Rudolph's voice goes down. So she mimics her exactly, but turns it up to 11. <laughs> I'm speaking. Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. Mr. Vice President, I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking. speaking. The fact that Kamala Harris has all of these different speaking styles has been seized upon by her political opponents as a weakness, um, even though you know we know that everybody can man's multiple styles. So J.D. Vance accused her of putting on a phony Southern accent. I don't know if you saw this, but earlier this week, look up the clip. She went down to Georgia, Georgia and started talking with a fake Southern accent. I'm serious. Now, what the hell is that all about? There's a few things going on here. One, J.D. Vance is sort of not picking up on the fact that everybody, even himself, sounds different when they talk to different audiences. So when he goes to the South, he sounds more Southern, too. We have the data. But also, he's confusing some features associated with white Southerners with African-American English. And you all helped us win in 2020. And in 2024, we will win again. And you all helped us win in 2020, and we're going to do it again in 2024. And this happens all the time. Before the Great Migration of the early 20th century, African Americans pretty much were concentrated in the South, and actually still remain concentrated in the South, but moved northward. What this means is that they brought their dialect with them. So we still see a lot of overlap between the vowels and some particular features of African American and white Southern varieties. Totally unsurprising. He's hearing her a black woman talking to a black audience using some features of African American as phony and Southern because he can't tell the difference. From that work, you know, everywhere I go, I tell people, you may not be a union member, but you better thank unions for that five day work week. You better thank a union member for sick leave. You better thank a union member for paid leave. Also, this has become a sort of productive line of attack for their campaign against her because she does have these multiple complicated intersecting identities, right? She's black, she's South Asian, she's from California, she's a woman, she's a Gen Xer. People that have the privilege of not having their identity called out all the time as remarkable don't seem to be able to think about navigating between different contexts. J.D. Vance gets to be himself, the same himself, everywhere, and that's seen as an acceptable way to be. But Kamala Harris, as a prosecutor and as a professional black woman, has had to spend a lot of time making herself more acceptable to different audiences. And this is something that resonates with all kinds of people from marginalized backgrounds. So um, I make TikToks about this. Women, people of color, immigrants, multilingual folks have all told me that they resonate with the fact that this is something that Kamala Harris does. It's a really normal part of how humans use language and people with less power have to do this as a matter of survival. Kamala Harris commanding different styles though is not only a liability, it can also be an advantage. So when she does casual campaign stops and she visits regular people all over the country, she is more likely to be able to be viewed as embedded in the community or to be able to relate these with these people in a more authentic way. Okay, let me see if Not I can much. figure this out. Too much. This uh -oh. Definitely so. <laughs> Cayenne, mm -hmm. black pepper, mm -hmm. garlic powder, mm -hmm. onion powder. Mm -hmm. You must be from New Orleans. Well, you know. The folks here are really impressed with her ability to know what's in the spice mix. And they say, oh, you must be from New Orleans, which of course is a place that we associate with flavorful food. Um, but the way that she talks in this room full of black people talking about food, this is like a home topic, this is a personal topic, is also more African-American style than what we saw, for example, when she was in the debate. It's more like when she's talking in other casual situations because this is how she talks around her community, which is multiracial and with black people that she grew up with 
in a setting where she's more comfortable. And this is not a liability, this is an advantage, but it's also a very normal human way that we use language. So we're gonna hear a lot more from Kamala Harris and from Donald Trump and everybody running for office over the next few weeks. And hopefully having seen these examples will give you more information when you hear any candidate talk to a different audience or when they're in a debate versus it's a rally or a casual stop. This is how language works. So you might even notice this in your everyday life. Pay attention to how you talk to your family versus your boss versus, you know, in a formal setting. It's a very interesting thing about the human condition that who we are always comes out in the way that we sound.